A traditional bank of desks uh, with teams working sort of in specific areas of a building and it was finance worked in this bit and um, FM worked in that bit um, and we operated hot desking at that point before COVID so we were all on a one to six ratio um, and the organisation had already started to move to sort of where we are now really we'd already identified the benefits of flexible working um, we changed our IT so a lot of our staff had laptops at that point um, and we were still in the process of rolling that out um, we changed our IT kit so there were a lot more docking stations in the building so people could come in and drop down um, but people still tended to move to their own area there wasn't very much mixing and there wasn't very much thinking about you could go to another floor um, so that gave us greater flexibility and at that point some officers would work from home so I'd work from home periodically but it was more around working from home if you had a particular task or maybe if you got something being delivered and you could work from home rather than the necessity to do it um, and our new ways of working were continuing to be developed at that point in time prior to lockdown. It was really weird because it feels so long ago now to actually reflect back, doesn't it? Um, I felt that at the time we were prepared because we'd already put all these IT provisions in place. Um, but once we knew it was there, there was a huge amount of work. Um, we had to obviously make sure that all of our buildings were safe. We went through a whole remit of working with other groups, health and safety, um, in respect of safe systems of work. So signage, buildings, extra enhanced hygiene, all of those sorts of things that would help keep those people that needed to come into the office safe. But the biggest driver at that point was actually getting DSE equipment out to staff working from home. Um, and the problems we encountered was when people knew it was happening, suddenly kits were walking off on their own. Um, you would see somebody walk out with a chair or a screen or whatever. It's like, no, hang on, what's happening? Um, so actually getting some protocols in place to help that kit migration out to people's homes to make sure that they were DSE safe. Um, and the whole working from home protocols, because it was very much ad hoc pre-COVID. You didn't really worry about a DSE assessment because you just put your laptop on your dining room table and worked for a few hours. That's not great longer term. Um, so we spent quite a lot of work going through all of that, putting all those protocols in place. Um, and the rollout of Microsoft Teams got escalated up very quickly um, because we needed to enable that so we can empower people to start speaking to each other regularly, get together as groups, all that live documentation and collaboration. Um, we needed the technology to do that. Um, so everything just went mad. I think that part of it was the physical environment. It's how do you reduce this transmission when the whole world is, is going mad? Um, and people seem to think differently so what my perception was about you keep your own space some people didn't seem to be worrying about it so that that really concerned me not just because of the buildings but because of how people were in general um, but the biggest thing was how long were we going to be in this state I mean we all have business continuity plans all of those sort of things kicked in but they tend to be very much short term whoever knew we would be this far in and still having to be working on it and still having questions from people about what are we going to do and at the beginning, that was my biggest worry, is how long are we going to have to work with this and how are we going to cope with those changes? I think that was how best do we support the services um, because everybody's need was different um, and FM suddenly became the top of everybody's agenda. Nobody ever thinks about FM pre-COVID and now all of a sudden everybody wanted to know what we were doing and how we were going to clean and how we were going to make people safe. And, services and people that I'd never spoke to before just came out of the woodwork and it's like what can we do that's my biggest worry is how we support how we supported people in that magnitude I touched on it just now really the provision of equipment um, we we started off because of the risks of transmission putting in a delivery service 
So we had to have a whole monitoring process, what was going, what all our asset tags were, who'd got them, who hadn't got them, um, a whole regime around what they had to do with them and how staff had to manage them. So that took up a quite a lot of time to start with. Um, sourcing of PPE, signage, all of those sorts of things, that was coming at me left, right and centre. Everybody wanted something different. Um, and sourcing of supplies was just becoming really, really difficult and everybody was competing against themselves. So we pulled a corporate group together and started ordering as an organisation rather than our street services going out and ordering one thing and our buildings going out and doing another um, and trying to get that put in place so that everybody wasn't competing and we got things at a good price um, because the costs were just going through the roof. Um, and then it was this, all the safe systems of work. So working really closely with health and safety, working out what our occupancy numbers could be because everybody still wanted to come into their same space. So how many people could we have in? What was the distance in measures need to be? What all the one way systems had to produce? And, and more importantly, the communication of all of that. So it was all well and good producing all these templates and risk assessments and getting staff to fill all these in if they needed to come into a building. But what we found was actually disseminating that across the organisation was really difficult. And what you thought was quite good communication trails actually just created delays. Um, so somebody would hear something on the news and say, oh, we're doing this now. And before we'd even had a chance to get together with the strategic groups and the managers and all of those people and put something in place, people have been going off doing their own thing. So trying to hold on to that communication and making sure that everybody understood um, was phenomenal and it still is to be honest it's still one of the, the greatest challenges you, you tend to see it from your own team first um, rather than across the organization and because my team deliver the service their morale was quite high because they were physically doing something feeling like they were achieving something and able to support um, but we've over the organisation, we've conducted surveys um, three since COVID just to start to understand what it actually means. Um, and I think we were quite fortunate. It's one of the things we did particularly well is that we understood right from the start people working at home every single day, trying to mix home working with life was going to cause concerns and it was going to have an impact on people's well-beings. So we put a lot of things in place to help support that, um, both guidance across the organisation for individual teams, as well as HROD. So we put in things like, ex we recruited extra wellbeing champions. Um, we put um, hubs and drop-in stations for people to come in and see wellbeing specialists if they were having any concerns, right through to actually, why don't we have a quiz every so often with our groups and sending out newsletters to engage with people. Um, so I think wellbeing, um, and morale changed, but I'm not convinced it was because of the office space, um, because we'd actually put in place um, a requirement that if a service needed to come and work in a building, they could put a case forward to say that they needed to do that. This was all the risks that they'd taken into account. It was a, um, a service requirement. And as long as the health and safety aspects were signed off, they were allowed to come into the building. And we did the same for welfare issues. So if a member of staff was having a real serious issue at home, I don't know, you know, kitchen table needed to be for the kids homeschooling as well as the individual working and you're all trying to have breakfast. We had some people come to us and say, I just can't do this. Um, and as long as there was a genuine reason, we were able to let them come back into the building. So I think with the wellbeing surveys, although they were showing there were wellbeing issues, we haven't actually managed to relate that to building physical building usage. It was other factors. I, I've thought about this and I'm, I honestly can't think of anything I would because it was so reactive you didn't really get much of a chance to plan. We all had our, as I said earlier, business continuity plans. So we all knew where everybody was, what we needed to do. But how you physically drive something forward of that magnitude, I'm not sure I would have done anything differently. The comms was the only thing for me, but I didn't feel I had much control over that. Um, and we are at the moment still doing lessons learned and what we could do better. Um, so I'm sure there'll be things that come out of that. But from an FM point of view and a building's perspective, 
I'm not sure there would be very much I would do differently. So for us, we are still going through that period of change. Um, I think if you walked into a building, you probably wouldn't notice much difference because the layout of desks is still very similar at the moment. We haven't done anything dramatic um, in respect of, I don't know, putting banks in differently. Um, but we have brought in more drop down zones, more collaborative working space. Um, so certain floors now are collaborative working space only. Um, other areas will have a drop down zone in the middle of a, a normal group. Um, so I think what you'd you'd feel a difference in how people are working rather than seeing a difference in the spaces particularly. Um, I mean, we. We're trying to encourage people to think differently. Um, and I think having a booking system and such like now that we brought in as part of COVID, that is going to be paramount to how we sort of continue in the future. But what we will see is um, more interaction with other teams um, because people will be coming into the building that don't normally work there and you'll move away from this. This is my space. It'll be, yeah, this is where I normally work, but actually I need to work somewhere different today. Um, so, like I say, we've re-engineered how we use the space more than changing what the space looks like. We're still primarily all working from home, um, partly because Plymouth has is, is got a really high COVID rate at the moment, so we're taking extra precautions. Um, but in respect of what it will look like in the future, we will still be encouraging home working. Um, and we are doing a piece of work at the moment called our new ways of working, which I'm sure everybody has. Um, and we're looking at our worker types. So we're looking at which people need to physically come in to deliver their service all the time, which people need to come in, um, which we're calling flexible workers, where they'll come in periodically, maybe two days a week, um, and others that are more remote working and don't really need to come in at all, but will need to drop in to do some printing or something like that. Um, so on that basis, we are expecting there to be much less um, office workers in our space. And because of that, we're revamping how we use our corporate estate. So we are looking at there will be buildings that we'll no longer be using. We're bringing teams to have zones in um, our current main buildings. Um, so at the moment, we're losing one um, that we know about at the moment, and we're in the process of moving people into that area. Um, what's interesting, though, is that some staff still think that we will all have a day where we'll just all come back in. Um, and it's back to that sort of communication and people's expectation. They seem to think, right, OK, one day we're going to flick the switch and everything will go back to normal. Um, and I find that quite strange sort of in the journey that COVID has taken us along. Um, so there still needs to be some communication and work with staff about what they can expect in the future. I think from what we've looked at with the figures, we're looking at about 20 percent of our workforce being office workers um, and the rest will either be um, flexible workers or potentially <clears throat> home workers that just need space. Um, that's quite a big difference. Um, like I say, at the moment, we're getting near enough two buildings worth of people into one building um, because there is no requirement for some of those people to come home. Sorry, come into the office. Um, and I. I think we will be much more collaborative. I think the the use of that collaborative space, um, I don't tend to think of it personally as a this these amount of desks will be collaborative. I think actually people have always worked collaboratively, but you've not seen it quite in the way that we are actually now going to see it. Um, and I think by giving people zones where they can say, actually, no, this is what I can do in this space today with these people is going to create that more much more flexibility and um, allow people to be a bit more creative, really. I think it depends which service areas you're talking about, because we still are having some resistance to that culture um, because of what I was just saying. They sort of think they're going to be able to come in en masse or they're, they're a group of people that, that are saying to us, for, for example, maybe finance colleagues are saying, well, actually, we're going to need this much space. But when you think about what they do, actually, they probably don't. They just need to be able to come in when they've got budget meetings, etc. Um, so it's a slow sh shift. I don't think we're honestly there yet. Um, by some of the, the questions that I get asked as an FM manager and um, 
some of the things you hear in meetings around how it might be in the future. I don't think the culture has changed enough. And I don't know whether that's just our, my organisation or whether that's um, across the piece. Other people I talk to outside of work, I, I still get the same feeling that people think it's very much actually will go back one day. Um, but I think what needs to be recognised is we've got a high number of people that think home working is good. Um, and I think our last survey showed about 70 percent that were working at home five days a week are still happy to continue to work five days a week. Um, and that's quite a high percentage of people that are saying, actually, yes, this works for me. And I think that's that's the culture that will start to to change is when they're seeing people working from home. And we've got that opportunity to have those off the cuff meetings and a quick chat with a friend that you miss in the office environment. Um, I think as long as we can offer people the opportunity to what to what works best for them, then you'll get the buy in all the time you start dictating to people what it needs to be. That's where you'll come across some of your resistance. What I'm being told from other services, it's it's not had as much impact in respect of outcomes or outcomes. So I think actually it it opens up the divide between manager styles. So managers who are very much actually, I don't mind what you do, when you do it, as long as I can have X by Y, that's good enough for me. It needs to be of a good standard um, and that's what I need. And those managers who've managed like that pre-COVID will find how we're working now much easier. Those managers that like to micromanage or get regular updates and be talking to people about and checking in progress all the time and feeling like they needed to be on someone's back are going to struggle now with the way we're working because they don't have that ability to do that. Um, and we have noticed that there is different managers and how they work across the organisation. Um, but from what I'm being told, actually, it's not causing a problem in respect of output. Um, but it's 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 hard for me to reflect on that because an FM service has different outputs. So this is just um, things I'm hearing on the grapevine, things I go to at meetings um, that we're just working in a different way now. I think with organisations becoming more hybrid, employees will expect there to be a much more seamless move from home to office. So they are going to be expecting to rock up into an office and be able to do whatever they need to do. Um, and we'll have to make sure that that change in that working environment is smooth and doesn't cause any disruption. So things like making sure the IT kit is going to work regardless of whether you're plugging in at home or whether you're plugging in in the office. Um, but also, I think we will become the true enablers of that flexible collaborative space because we are the ones that are going to be creating it for people based on the feedback of what they want. Um, so I think that's really exciting. Um, it's not just coming through the front door and there's everything you need. It's going to be actually coming through the front door and what do you need? Um, and that's that's where I think we'll be in the future. Well, facilities management for Plymouth comes under HR. Um, so we've always had quite close working relationships anyway. Um, and that has been really helpful because actually the department covers health, safety and well-being, HR and facilities, both hard and soft services. And actually that's enabled us to work really closely together over COVID um, and actually championing what we're trying to deliver from all aspects has been great. It's been one of the successes, in my opinion. Um, it's enabled us to respond to a customer request or something that's going on in that holistic way not just, OK, I can do this or oh, health and safety have told me I can't. Um, we've we put in together a um, safe systems of work group very early days, which consisted of health and safety representatives and facilities management representatives. And it meant that actually whenever we were doing anything, be it occupancy checks, um, risk assessment templates, we worked together to pursue that. Um, now, IT sits slightly outside of us. 
um, but there's been really close work with our transformation team um, about how we can now provide other digital solutions um, to how we can support colleagues that are working from home. Um, I mean, we know, for example, that we've got to get much more up with um, smart boards and, and the like so that when you have come in for a collaborative space you're able to have those hybrid meetings and it's not just about you've come in to be collaborative with this group in the office it's you're being collaborative with this group in the office but these people are working from home and those partners that might be in scotland for example um, so it's about being able to offer that greater sense of support um, our it provider is an external company um, but we work really closely with them to provide everything we need to, and that will continue to go on through COVID and beyond. So at the moment, we just have a desk booking option. Um, but what I've um, put forward in a business case is to expand that based on some of the things I already talked about. Um, we want the visitors module so that we can use that. Um, we've had some conversations around um, redesigning our space so that we can actually book that collaborative space um, and drop down zones, etc., as well as stagnant desks, for want of a better way of putting them through the system and having those plans drawn up for us. Um, and I'm also interested in the car parking module because car parking is um, a real big issue for us. I um, mean, as much as we don't have very much space, um, but also with our um, carbon neutral agenda, we're trying to encourage people to not drive to work um, to try and make sure that they can um, use transport links. Um, so part of being able to come in and um, use electric vehicle docking stations, for example, we're working through that at the moment. And Plymouth is doing a huge piece of work about having public um, docking stations around the city um, hubs that are being called. Um, so I want to sort of encourage people to be able to come in with their electric vehicles, book them in, be able to charge them for a while um, and be able to then move on if they need to. So at the moment, we've got some partners um, that have um, other spaces. They've got three locations within the city. Um, and we're going to do a three month trial with them to see how that works in respect of our staff being able to just drop in to their workspace um, and take up a desk and use their IT equipment um, for a period of time. What we're trying to work through at the moment, whether that will need to be a booked space um, because we can't integrate our booking system and their booking system at the moment. Um, so what we're looking at is, well, actually, will you have enough space if just 10 of my guys turn up? And they're saying, yes, we will. So what we're being able to say to staff is, OK, for a three month period, there are these three locations that you can go and trial. Um, and the feedback from staff is really positive, um, especially when we're considering our, as I said, our carbon neutral um, status. People are actually saying, well, actually, that that space is going to be much nearer to my work. Um, and my home. So actually I could walk to there and log in um, rather than coming all the way into the city where I'd either need to drive my car or get a bus. Um, so that's sort of helping us as well with that other strategy that's going on, um, our travel to work strategy. Um, and that's sort of quite exciting. <laughs> they need to be able to react quickly to changes as we found. Um, be ready for the unexpected. Um, and I think one thing that facilities that people don't always think about is that um, actually our colleagues are our customers. Just because we're all in one organisation, they are still our customers. And never be surprised by what a customer or a user might ask of somebody to do in the name of facilities management. They get asked to do all sorts of things. Um, um, Facilities now, as I said, has gone up people's list of contacts. Um, so now I get called in for all sorts of things, whereas people would never have thought about it before. Um, but yeah, it's it's a unique world. It's not a world I came from. I've only been in facilities for the last four years and it is so different. It's so reactive um, and you've just got to be on your toes all the time. But that's exciting. If you're, if you're that type of person, then it's an exciting world to be in. Well, I have already um, sung your praises to other people, so um, I can't remember which local authority it was. Um, 
but I, I found it amazing. Um, the support we've had has been second to none. Um, the setup timings and getting everything up and running um, was very quick. I picked up the work from my colleague, John Hicks. Um, but the service it provides is great. Um, we had a few teething problems that were just user um, client issues more so than anything else. The users weren't familiar with the whole checking in times and those sorts of things. Um, but once it got up and running and the staff were used to um, what they needed to do, it's been a godsend. Um, brilliant service, um, brilliant people to work with. Um, and the, the help desk has been great. We've never had any long delays with anything we've needed. We've always got a very quick response. Um, I would recommend it to anybody.